I'm really thankful to be able to share with you today and did want to just start this message with prayer, but thinking on the song that we just sang, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We have so much to look forward to in this life, but most of all, the life to come with our Lord Jesus. So let's pray together. God, we just thank you for the hope that we have in you, that we can have in you. Lord, we thank you for the amazing gift of grace that you have given us through Jesus. And Lord, as we come and hear a message today, God, I just ask that it would be you speaking, not me. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, that you speak to our hearts through your word and that you speak through us, Lord. And so I just ask that today it wouldn't be my words, but your words, and that each one of us, me included, would recognize more and more how awesome you are and how you have made us for your purposes. So we just pray these things and thank you for this time in Jesus' name, amen. I'm really excited to start with you all this morning, this new series that we're gonna be in over this coming term, I think. And it's a series called Keys to Life, where we're going to be looking at different questions or themes that if you have the answers to these questions, it's like having the keys to life. And so this morning's question is one that perhaps you've asked yourself or someone's asked you, what was I made for? What was I made for? Maybe you've asked that question or a question kind of like that. And it's a good question to ask because as we get into this life, as we grow up and get into work and figuring out how to live life, it can kind of seem the same. It can kind of seem like we're just doing the same things day in and day out. And we can kind of go, what's the point? What is the meaning of this? I wanted to share from Ecclesiastes, I'm just gonna read Ecclesiastes 1, 2, and then one verse two, and then jump to Ecclesiastes chapter two, verses nine to 11 where the author of this, King Solomon, says, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. Chapter 2, verse 9, so I, King Solomon, became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me. And my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors, but as I looked at everything I worked so hard to accomplish, it was also meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Seems like a valid statement. Maybe you felt that at different points in life. See, King Solomon, who wrote this, this is a book in the Bible written by King Solomon, King David's son. He was one of the most wisest, wealthiest, well-known people in the world. He had everything that he could ever want, everything he ever needed. And we find him with this perspective. Everything is meaningless. All of the finances, all of the work, all of the popularity, all of the things that you could want in this life, he had it. And he actually found, while it may have been fun, may have been enjoyable, when it came down to it, what really was the point? And so perhaps like Solomon or myself, or many other people who've lived, you've asked that same question, like is, 
Is everything meaningless? Is there more to life than this? What was I made for? Is there more to life than just growing up, studying, maybe going to uni or going to work, getting a job and working in that job so that you can travel and have holidays or so that you can buy the things that you want in this life and then you end up working, eating, cleaning, sleeping, repeating over and over and over and over again. And that's all we do. You were made for more than just repeating those things over and over and over again. Those are things that you're going to do in this life because we need certain things to survive. But you were made for more than just eating and working so that you can eat and work and sleep. Just, you were made for more than that. The amazing thing is that Solomon actually says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, after saying that everything is meaningless, in verse 11 he says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. And he planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. See, deep within each one of us, as Solomon said, God has written eternity on our hearts. And so no matter where we are at in life, whether we're starting to wonder about who God is or asking the question about what am I made for, we have this thing in our hearts, this part in us that says there has to be more than this. And it's what we know. We know that there is from what we read in the Bible and perhaps from your own personal experience and the amazing things that God has done. But we know it from this well-known verse, John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, there is more to life than this because God has put eternity in your hearts because he created you to know him, to be ready for eternity with him. That one day when everything is gone, when all of the things of this world and this life have disappeared, he'll make sense of it all because we get to be in eternity with him. That's what you and I are made for, to live life in him. As John 3.16 says. But I wanted to explore that a little bit more and give us some kind of phrase that we can remember in our head if somebody asks us that question of if that question pops up in our lives or our minds again and we go, what am I made for? So I want to leave you with a bit of a phrase today. And I'll get to that phrase in just a second. Recently, we've had some roadworks on our road. They've been making the road to our house really, really nice. It's great now. But I've noticed as they're doing roadworks, they want to make everyone safe, make sure everybody knows what's going on. So they put signs and markings everywhere. And then you have to stop and obey those signs and markings to make sure that everybody is safe and that people are doing the right things. But one of these signs stood up to me and it actually stood out to me and it actually made me think of what we're made for. And you will have likely seen this sign. It's not the one that says 40 speed limits, not that one, although you do see those a lot. The sign that I saw said, look up and live. Look up and live. Now these signs are put in place to keep people safe because there's power lines, there's things going on, you need to make sure that you know what's above you when you're working and lifting things and all that kind of stuff. But I saw that and I was like, huh, look up and live. So, gonna look at that today and what it is you were made to look up and live. And so maybe next time you drive through roadworks and you see a look up and live sign, you'll be like, huh. That's my purpose, like I'm made to look up and live. So if that's all you take from this message today, great. You were made to look up 
and live. Now, when I say look up, I'm not saying look up at the sky and look up at the power lines, although from time to time you may need to do that. But I'm not saying just look up. I'm saying let's posture our eyes heavenward and our heart heavenward. Let's look up to Jesus, to look at him with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Look up to him, and as we do that, we live. So the first bit, look up and see Jesus. So you were created to see him. You were created for so much more than just living. We're created to look up and see Jesus, the Savior of the world. The thing is, this world that we live in wants us to get caught up in the busyness of this life. And it wants us to get caught up in so many of the problems that are going on that we can sometimes miss looking to Christ. We get through our day and sometimes we might go, I didn't actually pray today. Or I didn't even think or acknowledge my Savior today. And when we do that, we've missed the point of looking up and seeing Jesus. But you are made to look up and see Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 7 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. This is amazing what we've just read. Do we realize what he has done for us? This is what he wanted to do. He didn't just save us because that was something that seemed okay. It says this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. He is so rich in kindness. He is so rich in grace. He loved you before the world began and chose you. He wanted you and so he adopted you into his family. He continues in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. He says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins, you used to live in sin like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subjects to God's anger, just like everyone else. I'm going to pause there for a minute and there's this loud hum going on. (laughs) The world we live in, as we just read, and those that don't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, who have not made the decision to follow Jesus, ultimately, as we just read what Paul says, like the rest of the world, we used to be obeying the devil without even realizing it. It's because we lean into our own sinful nature. It's our sinful nature, that part in us that drives us to do the wrong things, that drives us to be separate from God. And over time, when those desires and thoughts are left unchecked, we stop to see that those things are wrong. We actually, our minds just start to accept that. And those things that are really wrong can seem right. And you see that in the world today as you look at society and see the things that now people say are totally fine when the Bible says are not not good at all. That's our sinful nature. And we used to be live like we used to live like that just as we just read. But Ephesians 2, 
verse 4 continues. It says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life. When he raised Christ Jesus from the dead, it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. God made you as his masterpiece. And so what were you made for? You were made to look up and live in Jesus as his masterpiece. By his grace, his amazing grace, he's paid the price and has a plan for you, his amazing masterpiece. The thing is, we need to live in it. We need to come to him and recognize that this life we live, we're made for him. We're made for that eternity. And so it comes in surrendering to him. And so that's the next bit is look up and surrender to Jesus. Look up and surrender to him. As we just read, we are his masterpiece. And so as we are his masterpiece, he has good plans for us good things that he wants each one of us to do. And those things come as we continue to live for him, as we surrender daily to him. Surrendering life to Jesus means you come to a point where you can't live this way that we're living anymore. We, we recognize our sin. We recognize our deep need of Jesus. And so we come before him and we say, I can't live that way anymore, Lord. I recognize that I need you, and so I want to walk with you each day. We ask him to come into our lives, to transform us, to change us into his person. And as we do that, as we walk each day trying to do that, it's this daily surrender to him where we live out his plan as his masterpiece. But we have to be aware that it is that daily choice, right? Because so I feel like for me, I know in my life, I made the decision to follow Jesus when I was a teenager. And I know that between from when I was a teenager to where I am right now, there have been times, maybe weeks, maybe days, maybe months, where I was not surrendered to Jesus because I wasn't surrendering to him. Jesus says it this way in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Surrendering to Jesus is a daily choice that we make. It's this process of sanctification. It's this process of being set apart for Jesus where we choose him each day completely to become holy as he calls us to be holy. He says in his word, he says that you are to be holy as I am holy. And hearing that phrase that we're meant to be holy, I know when I first read that, I was like, that's impossible. I can't be holy. But that's kind of the point because we cannot in our own strength, in our own abilities, it's not about us, it's about him. And so in my own strength, 
I am not. But in Jesus, in his amazing grace, in him at work, in my life, and in yours, he transforms us into these new people to be holy as he is holy. Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The next one is to look up and live in Jesus. So we look up and we see Jesus. We look up and we surrender to Jesus. We come to that point of following him, but then we need to live that out, and we've been talking about that daily choice, and that's what it is when we give our lives to Jesus. We begin that process of sanctification where we're becoming more and more like him, and so I have a reflection question for us. Is, are we becoming more like Christ? If I've given my life to Jesus, and I say I want to follow him, I'm meant to become more like him. So are we, are we doing that? Are we becoming more like Christ in the way that we love, in the way that we give, in the way that we serve, in the kindness that we share? How are we growing? If we're not growing in Christ-likeness, then perhaps we need to ask ourselves some questions on where we are at because you were made to grow with him. When we give our lives to Jesus, there's going to be changes. You're going to see changes in your life because he comes and he lives in our hearts and he gives us the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit kind of just flows out as we come to know him more and more. And you read about this in Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 19. Paul says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, so the desires that are just in us and part of us as a human, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, Selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's quite a chunk there that we've just read. These are the things in us that are not if you are in Christ, then you don't have to have anything to do with that anymore because the Holy Spirit gives us new life, produces new fruit in us, continues in Galatians 5 verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. I remember when I was a new Christian, I was 14, and I was actually sitting in the chappie's office at her high school, and Galatians 5 came up, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. This, this is how I can become more like Christ. And I found this, this list, and if you've grown up in Sunday school, you perhaps memorize the fruit of the Spirit in a song, and you can rattle those things off, love, joy, peace, patience, you can just rattle them off just like that. And that's an amazing gift to have to know the fruit of the Spirit. But I guess we ask ourselves the question, does that fruit come out of my life? Because that's the growth and the change that is taking place in us as we grow and know Jesus. Verse 24 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. When we are walking in Jesus, we're going to say we do not have anything to do with that sinful nature. That part of me is gone. 
I'm, it's not me anymore. Those things have been nailed to the cross, and I have been given new life in Jesus. We will follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Ephesians 4 Verses 21 to 24, Paul writes, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learnt the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. When we come to Jesus, when we surrender to him, and we look up and live in him, there's going to be that change, the fruit of the Spirit, the Christ-likeness growing in us. And so no longer do we need to put on or wear at all the sinful nature, because that's not who we are. That's not who you were made to be. You were made to be truly righteous and holy, just as we read. The thing is, sometimes I think and I, I know I've shared this kind of thought before, but we, we come to know Jesus and we're like, cool, I'm going to heaven, I'm saved, that's great. And, and then we just keep on doing what we've always been doing. But that's not what you were made to do because that path still leads to that same hopelessness because we end up just battling this, the things that we know we need to do. It's like when you've been out working really hard, you're all really hot and sweaty, you've done all this work or maybe playing sport, I don't know, and then you go, you have a shower, and then you go and put your sweaty clothes back on. That's what it's like. It's like we've got new clothes to put on that are clean and crisp and they smell so nice because they're washed and new, but we choose to go back to the sweaty, stinky clothes that we've been wearing. And it feels gross. And you don't want to wear those clothes again. But sometimes, for some reason, we kind of just do that. We don't need to do that. That's not what you were made to do. You are made to put on these new clothes, your new nature created in Christ Jesus. So are we growing? Are we choosing to put on our new nature created in Christ Jesus, or do we go to some of the things that we shouldn't go to anymore. And if we're in that struggle, there is freedom because you weren't made to live in that hopelessness. You weren't made to live in that place of feeling ugh all the time. You were made for that life of joy and peace and hope that is in Jesus Christ alone. It doesn't mean that life is super easy. It doesn't mean that hard circumstances never come our way but it means that when we're in them, he is with us. It means that when we're in those times, he is our peace, that he is our joy, he is our strength. And no matter what happens, I'm gonna trust in him because he is the one I was made for. So again, as we look up and we live in Jesus, as we grow, we'll wanna know more about him. We'll want to get to know more about him. And so we'll head to his word. We'll spend time in his word. And as I was preparing, there are just so many, so much in here. I mean, it's the word of God, it's the truth. There is so many verses that I wanted to add to this message because they're just so good. And honestly, we could just read this. And that's why I've got so much scripture throughout this because it's the truth. It's the truth. It's the thing that transforms us. As Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. If we want to grow, if we want to become more like Christ, we're going to be in the Word of God because that's what will transform you. That's what will cut things in your life to show you the truth, just as we read. And when we read the Bible, we know that it's God's Word. As 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us 
when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. We need the word of God. And so I want to encourage you, if you want to grow, if you want to know more about Christ and grow in his likeness, let's be reading it. Because this is what he is able to transform you as you read this. He wants to show us his truth. He wants to sanctify us by his truth. And he does that as we spend time with him. The final point is look up and live with Jesus. So we're made for this life on earth to get to know Christ. We're made to grow in his likeness. We're made to share that with other people as Matthew 28 tells us to go and make disciples. We're made to tell of his goodness and share the gospel with other people because ultimately we're made for eternity with him. We're made to live with Jesus as we read in John 3:16. It's what we were made for. It's what we read in Ecclesiastes where Solomon says he's planted eternity in our hearts. We are made for life with Jesus. Jesus said it in John 17 in his final prayer, I guess. He talks about this world in verse 16 and 17. He says, they do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. We do not belong to this world any more than Jesus did, does. We are part of a kingdom, his kingdom, that is going to be more amazing, is more amazing than we can imagine or understand as we just sang this morning. But we also know that we're not made for this world and that we're made for eternity from other verses as well. Jesus says in John 14, one to three, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. One day, he's going to make everything new. One day, he's going to come back to bring us into this eternity that we were made for whether that is when our lives end on earth or when Jesus comes back to take us home. If we are living lives in Jesus, if we are living our lives looking up to him and walking with him, then we have this hope. We can be confident that we get to be with him for eternity. That's a promise. It's the very thing that we were made for. The very thing that we can look forward to with hope and joy, to be with Jesus. And so we get to live with Jesus now, and one day we get to live with him for all eternity. But again, it's not anything that we do. It's not anything in our own strength. It's all from Jesus. And so what were you made for? You were made to look up and live. To made to look up and see Jesus, to see the Savior of the world, to look up and surrender to Jesus, giving our lives daily to him, taking up our cross, denying ourselves and following him. We were made to look up and to live in Jesus, putting off our old ways and putting on our new nature to be like Christ Jesus, and we were made to look up and live with Jesus, to live with him in his kingdom for all eternity. So there is more to life 
than this, because when you have Jesus, all of those other things gain new meaning, because it's not just about going to work, it's about living the life of Christ in my work. It's about loving others in my work and pointing other people to him so that they can have this hope of eternity as well, so that they can be free from sin because of Jesus. It means that whatever we're doing, it's going to be for his glory. As 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or you drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So is everything really meaningless, as Solomon said? Well, some things, I guess, if we're striving for success in this life, in whatever it may be, there can be good things in that, and those things God can use to share this hope, but those are not the ultimate thing of success. Living with Christ Jesus, walking with him, it's in Christ alone. So one day, when he returns or when he calls us home, my prayer is that each one of us would be daily walking with him because ultimately that is what you and I were made for. I want to close with these verses in Hebrews 13, verse 20 to 21. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for your amazing grace, that you love us so much, that you have made us to live life with you and in you. Now on earth, living life, knowing you and walking daily with you, and what an amazing joy that is. But then one day, we're going to get to be with you for eternity. And how amazing and wonderful that will be. We thank you so much that you loved us and you love us so much that you sent Jesus to die in our place, taking on all of the penalty and punishment for my sin, the wages of my sin, our sin. And you took it upon yourself on the cross. What amazing love and gift of grace you have given us. And so, Father, help us to walk in that, to be reminded of that, to be reminded of how amazing your grace is and to choose to walk with you each day. Lord God, we need you. Forgive us, Father, for how we can be so prone to wander and to get caught off guard. But Lord, may, may our focus be on you. Help us to fix our eyes on you, to look up, to you, Lord, to live with you. And we pray for those who don't know you yet, who don't know how to look up and live. Father, help us to be the people that go and share your gospel with them. That those people that we know and love who don't know you yet, that their hearts will be opened and softened to your truth that they wouldn't be content in following the ways of this world, that we also wouldn't be content in that, but that we would recognize your truth. Thank you that your truth, well, the truth sets us free. You set us free. So, Father, may we walk in your freedom and all that you've done. And just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.